I, I'm, uh, I'm Dan Jeffries. I don't have anything to sell you, so this is going to be a little bit different. <laughs> um, so I've been writing about, I'm an, I'm an author, a futurist, and a thinker. Right? And my ideas have inspired dozens of different projects. And it's important to kind of understand kind of the context of this, why it's important. So blockchain and distributed consensus technology um, is really an example of triple entry accounting. So my most famous article about, is about that, and I almost buried it because I thought, who cares about accounting? But if you understand that accounting has really only had um, two major innovations in the history of mankind before blockchain, both of which presaged a massive uptick in human and economic complexity. Okay? So if you think about single entry accounting, this is back when the kings and queens ran the world. And your accountant was your brother, right? And, and the lords. And the reason that was the case is because you only have one entry in the ledger. Johnny owes me 50 bucks, right? So I wiped that out. Now Johnny doesn't owe me 50 bucks. There's no other record of it. So you really needed to trust your accountant, okay? Um, and so you weren't able to do a lot of different types of transactions. You were only able to work with a local tribe or with a smaller community, right? Because you couldn't do business with people that you didn't really know. Double entry accounting started with Viennese traders in the 1400s. So now you had people with ships that could go all around the world, and they were starting to trade with people that they never met before. So they needed a new system to do this. Right? And so they came up with double entry accounting, which, by the way, is still the system that we use to today. Okay? And that's I have a debit and you have a credit. Or I have a credit and you have a debit. Now we both have a receipt that the transaction has happened. Okay? But now we've kind of reached the limits of what we can do with that technology. Okay? So a good example is like if I issue you a stock and I say, look, I'm giving you 10%. You don't really know whether you got 10% because you don't have access to their books because it's a security violation, the double entry accounting system, right? QuickBooks, everything that you use for your taxes, everything, it's still a double entry system. That's why things like Enron can happen where they can cook the books, you're not able to look at it. But in blockchain, I have a triple entry, right? There's, I have a debit, you have a credit, and there's a third entry, which is a ledger of all the transactions that have happened. So if I'm able to issue a stock, for instance, on the blockchain, then I'm able to look at that and say, look, okay, there's a million shares. I don't have access to your books, but I still know I got 10%, right? So we're going to see a massive uptick again in human economic potential and complexity. We're still in the caveman stage of this, right? We were talking, you know, he was just talking about how we need to have better technology to deal with the fact that this money can just get lost, if your, if your smart contract is wrong, if some punk kid checks the wrong thing into GitHub, right? Un these things are going to become unacceptable. We're going to have to develop better technologies in order to make sure that those smart contracts really work every time, right? And so these are the types of things that are kind of coming down the pipe right now. And we've got what I want people to really think about if you're going to, for instance, design a token. There's a lot of different ways to do it, okay? And by the way, it's not just economics. There's... Uh, a lot of my early work was in uh, decentralized identity technology and in decentralized voting. There's a million different things that you can do with this technology. It's not about just an arcade token or, or changing money or buying coffee and Snickers. We already know how to buy Snickers, right? So the real innovation, I think, as I started to look at this, and I've been looking at it for a long time. I started trading my first Bitcoin at 13 bucks. I wish I'd kept all of them, but... Uh, you know, I lost half of them in Mt. Gox, and then I didn't have the courage of my convictions for a lot of them, right? Um, but, you know, what's interesting is why it is revolutionary is because it allows us to do, um, to create and distribute money without a central power. Now, what Bitcoin got correct was the first part, creating money without a central power. But distribution is where I think they messed up. Or it's not messed up, Bitcoin is still fantastic and it'll serve a specific purpose. But the distribution of money is actually where it gets really interesting if you're going to go ahead and create something now. If you really think about economics, economics is a giant game. And if you can distribute the money across the board, more people can participate, which means 
that the economy is bigger and moves faster. Okay, so what they did is they still had the typical pyramid model. We took, unelected, we took a bunch of unelected central banks. We created a bunch of unelected centralized miners. Right? Awesome. No, not awesome. It's awesome because there's going to be a few different types of coins in the future. Deflationary saver coins are going to be big. Slightly inflationary or slightly deflationary spender coins. Because you're not going to go buy Snickers if it's going to cost you, you know, $2,000, you know, tomorrow. Right? And then the last one that I like to talk about, really, actually, there's, there's another one I'll talk about, what I tend to call an action token. EOS has talked about this best. I was talking about this for years. You've got to have free transactions on, on blockchains, okay? And EOS says it best. If you, if you have to go to Amazon, it costs you three cents to load the page. You're never loading the page, okay? So there are certain types of transactions that have no value on a network whatsoever. So you want to consider making something. You want to consider making it in such a way that certain transactions are free. The last one I'm going to talk about is a reward-style token or a gamified token. And, and Naval Ravikant, who is the founder of AngelList, um, is talks a lot about how blockchains can create a new type of economy, a market network that has never existed before. Okay, And the market network incentivizes the thing that the network wants. So I'll give you a good example of how you build a gamified token that's really valuable because you want to build one of the tokens that's going to survive the crash. They talked about the internet crash, right? Now, most of those, uh, most of those uh, internet companies went down about 85%, including Amazon and all the other ones that survived. Okay? Many of them went to nothing. So you want to design a token that has the most utility whatever, possible. Right? So if you think about something like, a, a, like Kickstarter, Kickstarter has a very simple model. I come up with an idea, I put it up there, you guys give me a bunch of money, they keep 10%. So Kickstarter benefits, the people who put it up benefit, and, and you got a free t-shirt or a board game for giving them your money, okay? So, <laughs> not, you know, so if you were to create a, a utility token, you could start to incentivize all of the things that matter to the network. So a good example is you might give out a token to all the people who are uh, having the biggest uh, impact on the network, all the people who refer people to your network who actually make a donation to someone else on there. You might, get, you might donate to all of the biggest donators on the back end. Right? So what you're doing is you're incentivizing all the behaviors that you want, de-incentivizing the behaviors that you don't. So you're better off making a list of all the things that benefit your business and the things that don't benefit your business. Now somebody talked about Steemit. I'm sorry if you're, they're your client. I'm going to use them as a negative example, as a caveman example. They're a caveman example because the people have learned how to game the system. So as much as people love to build a system, they love to break a system as well. So a lot of the stuff that's on Steam, it is total crap. And the reason it's total crap is because what you do is you go grab 500 of your friends to vote up your crap story and you pump it out in 10 minutes, right? So you also want to think about all the ways to break your system, to cheat your system, right? And you might build something like a reputation bank, okay, which allows people to, uh, you know, which allows you to kind of rank the people on the system or rank the types of content on the system so that it's not being cheated, and you have certain types of rules that would be updating over time, right? So that your platform, you know, it does the things that you want and is not cheated. Just like in, in video games, where people are playing these massively multiplayer games, they have these rules where they're looking to defeat the people who've built a, a bot to, to go mine all the gold overnight while they're sleeping, right? So you want to be thinking about those things as well. So these types of tokens are going to be very, very popular in the future. I call them sort of universal reward tokens. You also want to be thinking about the fact that most people are not going to have a Snickers token and a Starbucks token and a hat token and a shoes token, okay? They're, the utility tokens are going to need some way to have a medium of exchange and consume value. And so you really want to be thinking about building a meta token, meta, a universal token, right? A token that would have rewards beyond what you're already doing. So it's nice that I get a Starbucks reward card, but I can only spend it on Starbucks. That kind of sucks. Then I got a CVS thing, and now I got 50 of these rewards things. So I don't want 50 rewards tokens either. I want one rewards token. One or two or three or four are going to win out, and they're going to do 50 or 60 different things. I don't want to have to go change it into the Snickers token in order to buy the Snickers. I want to buy a Snickers 
and my shoes and my car with the same token, okay? And so you really want to think about meta characteristics and how you expand beyond the current token's value. So you start with a simple definable idea and then you expand beyond that, right? One of the examples I used and I'm particularly proud of uh, was cat stickers and Adam's going to hate me for saying it, but I, I was using the idea of cat stickers, right? All these things right now are being sold as, um, as like privacy and anonymity. Guess what? The average public doesn't care about any of that, okay? They care about what they can do with your application. And the only applications that are going to succeed are the ones that are functionally indistinguishable from current applications plus have additional benefits. That's how new technology succeeds, right? And one of the things I talked about was stealth gamification. If you use an application like Viber, you get these free cat stickers, but you can also buy elite cat stickers. So imagine if you were getting those as a reward and all of a sudden you're getting these little coins, but you're not paying attention to it. Then you get your elite cat sticker and you click it, this little blinky light. You're just a normie, right? And you go, oh, cool, I've got this marketplace. I can now buy these elite cat stickers, right? Now, I was using this example for months, and now CryptoKitties is now taking the world by storm and destroying the Ethereum network. So I'm particularly <laughs> proud of that example, right? Um, and so, you know, these are the types of things that you want to be thinking about. You want to be thinking about this in the context. And, and also, I want to give you an example, one last example before I wrap up, of having the courage of your convictions, right? So after I lost half my money in Mt. Gox, I, it was really a dark winter for me, and I didn't do trading for, for several years, and I thought, well... Maybe this is the technology, but maybe it's got to it's got to come back later. At the same time, Jihan Wu, uh, who's the biggest miner in the world, had created the first ASIC, uh, and he created it about three months before Mt. Gox, and he had invested a lot of money to build this ASIC. Is it dead now, or is it working? Um, so he had, he had invested a lot of money to build this ASIC, and then all of a sudden the market crashed. Okay, so he had two options at that point. One was to get out and never do it again. Uh, and the other one was uh, to stick to the courage of his convictions and keep going, right? And there's going to be setbacks in this industry, whether that's a regulatory setback, another exchange gets hacked, an entire, you know, smart contract language blows up overnight and loses $300 zillion, right? These types of things are going to happen, but it doesn't matter. It's going to be a blip on the radar because in the long run, this is the most important invention in the last 500 years.